I'm June Steckler, and this is a talk I gave at Colonial Church in Edina, Minnesota on Sunday, October 14th. I spoke to and with the Art Lovers Sunday School class at Colonial Church about a series of paintings I recently made and which are on display at Colonial Church. I named the series Kira, which means bless you in Karundi, which is the language spoken in the country of Burundi. The Kira series is mostly made up of portraits of women who are part of the work that World Relief and Colonial Church are doing in Burundi. 100% of the proceeds from the sale of Kira pieces goes to further this work. Side note, the group I was with in Indina doesn't call themselves the Art Lover Sunday School class. It's just how I think of them, because I think it's a cool name, and I'd go to that class. I called this presentation the intersection of faith and art. Until the day after I got back home from sharing it, and while casually flipping through it one more time, I spotted a giant glaring typo on one of the images I had shared. So, now I call it the intersection of faith and art and at least one giant glaring typo. I became aware of the work that Colonial Church and World Relief are doing in Burundi through my friend Dawn. Her husband is a pastor at Colonial Church. When I heard that Dawn was going to Burundi this last year, I asked her if she was interested in me making paintings based on some of the photos that Kristen Gear, who also went to Burundi, had taken. She and the rest of the Burundi team were into this idea, so I worked on paintings and eventually put this presentation together to share with some of the folks at Colonial Church. So, pretend you are sitting in a great-looking church on a beautiful fall day in a diner in Minnesota, and an artsy type from California is talk-talk-talking about her art. I really love the words Dawn chooses, and in the description she sent me about my being here today, she wrote that I would be sharing about how my faith intersects with my art. I love that phrase, the intersection of faith and art. I've been thinking a lot about it this week as I mentally prepared to come here. I had high hopes for writing down some particularly meaningful thoughts and ideas about the intersection of my faith and art that I could share with you. But as life tends to go, my plans for getting some thoughts written down this week were consistently thwarted. I'll start with this fuzzy visual. This is where I created the Burundi pieces. At the intersection of my family's dirty clothes on the left, my writing jobs at my desk on the right, and my painting space back there in the corner. Apparently, sometimes the intersection of faith and art looks like a messy laundry room. Which is fitting, I guess, because while I do love painting and writing and thinking big, deep thoughts, the truth is that most of my life has to do with the intersection of my two sons, their needs, and my time and energy. The last few months, the intersection of my very full life and the date I told Don and Brian, another guy at Colonial Church, that I would have the Burundi paintings finished and shipped here to Colonial was definitely a matter of faith in my life. As depicted here in this highly flattering shot I took while painting one night. Thankfully, whenever I'm feeling too much like what I look like here, I can get a boost from the intersection of my younger son and his new puppy. And yes, my son looks quite a bit like a hobbit, and yes, I included this image mostly because I could not include a picture of the puppy. You don't get a new puppy and not show people. So, as I said, this last week I had very firmly set aside time to plan this very presentation, and then my plans were derailed by the almost intersection of a California forest fire and my house. And here is the glaring typo. Minnesota. Yeah, awesome. Thankfully, that ended well. So after that settled down and I had finally settled in to write down my thoughts and feelings about the intersection of my faith and art as it relates to the work going on in Burundi, an intersection of my big dog and a skunk took place. So instead of writing, I learned how to de-skunk a dog. But grace abounds. And as much as my man tribe, seen here, and my small dog tribe continually require me to abandon my arty efforts, I, of course, would not trade my life with them for all the writing and painting time in the world. I will introduce you to my family real quick. This is Nate. He is 10 and the cutest child ever. This is my husband, Brian. He is a steady eddy man of long suffering, mostly because he married an artist. Pray for him. And our older son, Zane, who is 13 and very artsy and verbal and overly animated and tall. I have no idea where he gets it from. So, after I recovered from kids, fires, dogs, and skunks, my thoughts on faith and art in Burundi turned, finally, to something my pastor recently said. He was talking about how our need is the heart of our relationship with God. 
That is a pretty obvious statement, I guess, but with Burundi on my mind, it got me thinking about how this universal need for God amongst humans is what makes me, an artist living in relative wealth in Northern California, exactly the same as a woman living in Burundi. Again, this is a fairly obvious statement, but sometimes the contrast of my experience of life, the world, and even God clouds my understanding of how much I truly am just the same as the people living lives so categorically different from my own. I am in desperate need of the living God, just as every other person on the planet is. I have heard it said that the antidote to the clouding effect of wealth, all kinds of wealth, is giving. By American standards, I am not a financially wealthy person, but let's face it, I am enormously wealthy in countless ways, and even financially, compared to the rest of the world, well, I don't even need to finish that sentence. So this is where grace has found me. It gave me the opportunity and compelled me to complete these paintings in the face of my all too typical perceptions of not having enough time or resources. There is a verse in Isaiah that I always think of when my need or the seemingly hopeless needs of others overwhelms me. It is this, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. One theologian wrote this about this verse. They said, All are welcome to the blessings of salvation. In Christ there is enough for all and enough for each. Where God gives grace, he gives a thirst after it. And where he has given a thirst after it, he will give it. Come to Christ, for he is the fountain opened, he is the rock smitten. So that's a bit about what has been in my head and heart in regard to making the art that is here. I thought I would also show and tell a bit about my art making in general. This is an image of a giant painting I made which was inspired by the photo below it, which is an altered image of tree bark that I took one day when I was on a run through the woods by my house. The natural world is the biggest inspiration for me in regard to art making, and I often use a quote by an artist named Rockwell Kent as part of my artist statement. This is what he said. My works are my own attempt to show in line or paint on canvas how beautiful I found the world to be. If to the viewer's eyes my world appears less beautiful than his, I'm to be pitied and the viewer praised. I like how he said that so much. I saw no need to remake the wheel, so I use his words. I usually write an artist statement for each show I have or if I make a new body of work. And last year I had a show in which I had this big giant painting, so I thought I'd share what I wrote for that show, which was based on this quote. I said, as it was for Rockwell Kent, so it is for me. Nature's colors, textures, and contrasts are unceasingly intense and compelling. An unexpected crash of spring green stuns me out of a funk. A timely leaf opens my mind. Blue skies remind me that I continue to breathe. Art making is my act of gratitude for all of this. That sounds a little intense as I read it now. Uh... Those words will make more sense to you if you suffer from seasonal affective disorder, as I do, or you are a tortured artist, or you tend to overthink, overfeel, and generally angst your way through life, as I do. Grace abounds. This is another example of my work and the effect that colors, particularly springtime colors, have on me. Last spring I was out for a run trying to get my winter addled head on straight and the usual endorphins weren't really kicking in as much as I wanted them to and I came around a corner and boom, the light was hitting a tree full of that brightest of spring greens when the new leaves look like they must have a layer of gold underneath their green color because they look like they're glowing and might burst right off the trees. This sight of spring light busting down from an intense blue sky down into the bright green world stopped me in my tracks, and I had a moment. Then I went home and painted this, which sounds totally inspired and spontaneous, and it was. But most of the time, of course, any decent work comes only after the requisite showing up and showing up and showing up and working, working, working. So that's not the norm, but it it happened there. This piece was largely inspired by the writings of Mako Fujimura, a great contemporary abstract artist, whose last name I probably just slaughtered, and C.S. Lewis. On my website, and when I have paintings on display, I almost always include some text with each painting, and often it's a quote that, for me at least, correlates to the piece. I'll read you the quote that I chose to go with this piece. It's from The Weight of Glory by C.S. Lewis. 
The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them, it only came through them. And what came through was a longing. For they are not the thing itself, they are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. I call these pieces the twins, and they live in my home. I like things in pairs. My sons, my dogs, paintings. Obviously, the Burundi portraits I painted are very different from this kind of work. I have done only a small amount of portrait painting, so before I started on the Burundi pieces, I took time to look at some images by portrait artists whose work I really like. These pieces are by Paul W. Ruiz. I really, really like his work, and it's okay if you don't. Just look away. My preparation for painting the portraits was to read all the information Dawn sent me about the Burundi women uh, that she had met and that World Relief and Colonial Church are working with, to look long and hard through all of the photos that Kristen shot, and then to feed my eyes with portrait painting I like, such as these pieces. I knew that if I did all that and prayed all along the way that God would filter all of that through my head and down my arm and into my brushes and under the boards which isn't really a confusing process, but I still felt led to make this simple pictograph to show it. What can I say? I live with three males. I am well-practiced in communicating in as straightforward a way as possible. You go wash, eat, now. I thought I'd show you a little bit of the actual process and progression of one of the Burundi paintings, although this is kind of funny, showing only four steps like, yeah, it's that easy, boom, 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 boom. But at least it shows a little bit of how the paintings came together. It's hard to see, but that first shot in the upper left is a pencil sketch on a gesso board. Some of the questions people have had for me over the years include something like, why is your style so messy? I'm afraid my answer is not at all profound because really my paintings look messy because I like how messy looks. It's kind of that simple. It does have a little to do with mystery and that people and life are messy, but honestly, whenever I'm struggling with a piece and I'm not sure what to paint, I figured out by thinking, June, just paint what you want to look at. And something messy always results. So there you have it. Another question I've been asked is about all the drips in my paintings. Again, the main answer is simply, I like how they look. But there's a bit more of a reason, though it sounds sort of self-indulgent or at least maybe a little weird. Nonetheless, I'll go ahead and tell you. I cry often and easily. Granted, this is largely because I'm generally kind of a wreck, but it's also because the human condition is worth crying about. So, drips seem appropriate. Also, I was born and grew up in a very rainy place, so drips are kind of a part of my DNA. Lastly, a common question any of us can have when it comes to art is, what does it all mean? I only have an undergraduate degree in art, so for the most part, I can't answer that. I will say that in regard to my own work, including the Burundi pieces, to me, it means that art, especially abstract art, looks great and that life is messy and complicated and that to be human means to be heartbroken. But we all live with this amazing, transforming, eternal potential to be ultimately healed of our heartbreak thanks to the redeeming work of Christ. When I was putting my thoughts together for this, between kids and fires and skunks, my husband asked me a question about one of the Burundi paintings that I thought I would go ahead and answer today. In regard to the painting of Edisa, he asked me if there was a reason I left part of the wood exposed and raw on this piece. And the answer is yes, there is. My reasoning was twofold. One, I like how it looks. You saw that coming. Two, Edisa is the youngest person I painted for this series, and I wanted to emphasize her youth and fragility and the fact that the story of her life is mostly not yet written. It can seem like Adisa's little self and her little life are just that, little. But as we all know, there is no such thing as a little soul. This little girl, just as much as any other person, is completely worthy of all the love of God and all the life this world can offer. It's just that none of us yet know what her story and her life will be. Because of organizations such as World Relief and Colonial Church, the truth is we have an opportunity to affect her story, this raw, bare blankness of her future. So that's the reason I left so much of the board that I painted her on open and unpainted. Another obvious question that comes up when you look at the Burundi paintings is in regard to my choices and style. 
These two pieces show a pretty distinct range in brushwork, which begs the question, was that intentional, June, or are you just a hot mess? The answers to those questions are yes and yes. I definitely let the mood of each photograph determine the style in which I painted each piece. So here I put up this image of uh, the photograph and the painting, and I asked the people that were in the class if they wanted to share what kinds of words came to mind to describe the mood of the photo. And they said things like um, timid, contemplative, observing, shy, peaceful, those kind of words, which was great because that's what I thought too and how I tried to paint it. Then I put up this next slide and asked the same thing, and they said like joyful, vibrant, hopefully words that are going through your mind right now. And I agreed. In fact, the main word that I had in mind when I made this painting was joy. Another question that seems obvious when it comes to portrait painting is, why didn't you make the paintings look even more like the people actually look? Again, I have two answers. The first is, that's not my thing. I like messy, remember? The second reason is that I'm a big believer in the fact that no person is just one story. When I paint portraits, I do want the image of the person I am making to be recognizable, but I very much do not want what I create to look exactly like that person at the moment in time when whatever photo I am using as a reference was taken. This is just my own approach to portrait painting. I have a deep respect for artists who have the talent and skill to create paintings that look lifelike. We've all seen that and it's amazers. I like the idea that making a slightly abstracted portrait of a person has to do with the fact that each life is ongoing and that transformation is a constant option. So that's why. I put a few more images of Kristen's photos and my paintings in here. This Burundi woman is featured in the video that Kristen made. Uh, she is a mother of twins and in the video she is crying and smiling at the same time as she is being given medicine for her sick twin babies. And don't think I don't cry every single time I watch that. Don told me that this woman had just come from church when this photo was taken and that in the service, the pastor at the church had asked the congregation to commit to caring for vulnerables in their community and that he had quoted James 127, which says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. With that in mind, I chose Ubu, which means now in Kurundi, for the title of this piece because we don't know her actual name and because the call to act now is one I aim to keep in my life. Things like making art and even praying for my brothers and sisters around the world can so easily become a good idea versus a now action for me. Thank you again for having me here and listening to this. And thank you for the opportunity to make these paintings. Making them was a chance to embrace my lifelong goal to have giving and gratitude define my life. My pastor likes to say that giving is the best way to promote childlike trust in Jesus. And we know that as Christians, we bear a debt of love to each other. I believe we are called to be generous, recklessly, extravagantly generous. And at the same time, planning and structure should also define our giving. I have to believe that it is at the intersection of extravagant, reckless generosity and planned, structured giving where we are drawn closer to the heart of God, both individually and as a worldwide church. So that's what I said to the folks in Edina, Minnesota, not Minnesota. And I am happy to answer questions from you as well. If you'd like to email me or contact me on Facebook or buy one of these paintings. Again, 100% of the proceeds from all these paintings goes to the efforts that Colonial Church and World Relief are doing in Burundi. And prints are available as well. So let me know if you're interested.